This film explores an unlikely connection between the northeast of Scotland, the island of Tobago in the Caribbean, and the Western Isles. It reveals connections between Scotland's involvement in Caribbean slavery and 19th century clearances in the Scottish Highlands. And our story starts here, in Aberdeenshire. In this secluded part of Aberdeenshire, hidden from view behind an extensive granite wall and impressive gates, lies one of North East Scotland's most imposing country houses, Cluny Castle. It was King Robert the Bruce who granted the lands of Cluny to Sir Alexander Fraser early in the 14th century. But since the 17th century, Cluny has been the home to a series of different Gordon families. In the middle of the 18th century, John Gordon, a factor to the Duke of Gordon, made a fortune controlling and leasing the salmon fishings on the River Spey. He bought the Cluny estate with its fine 17th century tower house and established the current line of Gordons here. The old Cluny shared many features with Cluny's neighbour Craigie Var. Both were built by the Bell family of master masons. But unlike Craigie Var, the original Cluny is no more. Although the old Cluny disappeared, it was not demolished. It was actually incorporated into a massive transformation that took place in the early 19th century. This produced today's Cluny Castle. The castle was built for the fourth laird of Cluny, Colonel John Gordon. When he died in 1858, Gordon was worth, it was said, around two million pounds. That's roughly 160 million in today's money. His obituary in the Banffshire Journal called him the richest commoner in Scotland. But the newspaper was keen that its readers learn of his legendary tight-fistedness. It was said that he regularly took long detours in his horse-drawn carriage just to avoid parting with his money on the northeast's toll roads. On more than one occasion when he was stuck in the mud, he had to be rescued by the nearest available villagers. But John Gordon was not simply a very rich eccentric. The life of Colonel Gordon reveals some very uncomfortable truths about the man and about the Scotland that made him too. Gordon was fortunate indeed to be part of the upwardly mobile world of the Gordons of Cluny. He inherited from his father, Charles Gordon, the Edinburgh estate of Hermitage of Braid and from his uncle Cosmo Gordon, the Cluny estate here, as well as properties in Nairnshire, Banffshire and Aberdeenshire, as well as a townhouse in St Andrew's Square in Edinburgh's new town. But John Gordon's inheritance, substantial as it was, was not yet complete. He also inherited the estate of another uncle, known as Alexander of Tobago in the family. This Alexander owned several sugar plantations on Tobago, where he was a substantial slave owner. When he died in 1801, he left his Tobago estates and property in Scotland to his nephews, 
John Gordon, later Colonel John Gordon, and John's younger brother, another Alexander. John Gordon never married, but did have four illegitimate children. The mother of his eldest son, John, was Margaret Mackay, a 19 or 20-year-old domestic servant when their son John was born. Gordon was 44. The certificate of birth records that their son was born in fornication. Margaret Mackay later married a Nairnshire farmer and Gordon gave the couple a rent-free farm, Winewell, near Aldern. The mother of his younger son, Charles, was Mary Fraser. The mothers of his daughters, Susan and Mary, were not recorded. One consequence of his decision not to marry was that many years were spent in litigation in order to ensure that his estate passed to his own children rather than to his nephew, Charles, his legal heir. A House of Lords ruling after his death eventually upheld his wishes and his estate passed to his eldest son, John. All his other children died before him. John Gordon was driven by personal ambition throughout his life. In his twenties, he embarked on a grand tour of the Middle East, which included some of the great archaeological sites on the Nile. He carved his name on a number of them, including the Temple of Karnak in Thebes. This desire to leave his mark would be realised in his own country too. He made extensive additions to his properties in Scotland and sat as a Conservative MP for the English borough of Weymouth and Melcombe Regis between 1826 and 1832. He was an opponent of the 1832 Reform Act, which sought to widen the franchise, and he also opposed the Catholic Emancipation Act, which sought to give Catholics equal rights. In 1820, he chose John Smith as the architect for a massive project to extend the castle. The project would take almost 20 years to complete. John Smith rose to prominence in Aberdeen after 1807 when he was appointed as the city's architect. He went on to design numerous civic and private works throughout the city and the Shire. The column entrance to St Nicholas Kirk here on Union Street in Aberdeen was designed by Smith. It's fitting that he and his wife Margaret are buried here in the cemetery. Smith's architectural legacy includes the old town school in Belmont Street, not far from here and the Aberdeen Arts Centre building on King Street. He was equally at home designing the fishing village of Fitty near the mouth of the River Dee and the historic improvements to the Brigadier, another great Aberdeen landmark, were also Smith's design. But it was to be Clooney Castle that was Smith's most ambitious project and although architects and other observers have been divided on its merits, it has left a dramatic and a lasting impression. This castle symbolised John Gordon's wealth, power and influence. It was at the centre of a business empire which encompassed the rich agricultural landscapes of the North East, the sugar plantations of the West Indies, and included, as we'll see, 
the ancient clan lands of McNeil and Clan Ranald in the Western Isles, and the power that resided here controlled the lives of thousands of men and women on Gordon's land. Historians have recently begun to highlight the role of Scots in the slave economy of the West Indies and trace the financial and material legacies of slave-based wealth throughout Britain. Research is revealing the large number of Scots who made money as planters, merchants and managers. The links between the Gardens of Cluny and the West Indies date from 1770 when two Clooney brothers, Alexander and James, sailed to Tobago to buy land and establish themselves as planters. Within one year, James Gordon was dead, but Alexander Gordon remained and prospered. His family knew him as Alexander of Tobago. Colonel John Gordon of Clooney was Alexander of Tobago's nephew. The Gordons of Clooney and other Northeast families may have learned about opportunities in the Caribbean from the pages of the Aberdeen Journal, the forerunner of today's press and journal, the P&J. Today the P&J's offices are here in Marshall Square in the centre of Aberdeen. Today's paper keeps its readers informed of international as well as local and national news and it was no different in the 18th century. In May 1765, the Aberdeen Journal on its front page carried information about the purchase of new land and the establishment of plantations in the West Indies. Although Alexander Gordon may have owned six plantations at one time, he seems to have consolidated these into three main estates, Speyside and Trarivière, both in the northeast of the island, and Bacoli Estate in the south, two miles from Scarborough, the capital. Alexander Gordon's estates were said to provide an annual joint income of between 10 and 12,000 pounds. Colonel Gordon claimed that in some years his uncle's estates had made a profit of £30,000. The workers who produced this wealth, of course, were the enslaved men and women of West Africa and of West African descent who laboured on the plantations. In the first decade of Alexander Gordon's life as a planter on Tobago, there were at least four revolts by the enslaved against the plantation system, which treated them as chattel. In 1801, a planned uprising was discovered by the authorities before it broke out, and six of its leaders were executed. Some of these men came from the Gordon estate of Bacolay. The continuous suffering of plantation workers was indeed the true cost of the sugar and rum exports from Tobago and from the other islands in the Caribbean. Slave produced sugar from Bacolay and his other estates brought Alexander Gordon substantial profits. He bought property in northeast Scotland and in the Strand in London. When Alexander's elder brother Cosmo, the second Laird of Cluny and head of the family, drew up his will in 1784, it contained the following observation. My brother Alexander has no occasion for anything from me, as he is opulent. 
When he died in 1801, Alexander left his West Indies and Scottish properties to his two nephews, John, later Colonel John Gordon, and John's younger brother, another Alexander. Alexander lived on Tobago for several years, managing the estates. John Gordon does not seem to have visited Tobago. He concentrated his efforts on running his Scottish estates and building Cluny Castle. When slavery was finally abolished in the British Empire in 1834, the British government compensated the slave owners with £20 million from government revenue. The legacies of British slave ownership database shows that Colonel John Gordon and his brother received £12,483 in compensation for 653 slaves, a sum worth more than a million pounds at today's values. We don't know the details of how John Gordon received or spent his share of the West Indies income or his share of the slave compensation payments. The Gordon of Cluny family archive in the University of Aberdeen does not appear to have any correspondence or accounts on either of these subjects. But slave-based wealth was one of Gordon's many sources of income and it may have helped to finance the building of Cluny Castle and pay the wages of its renowned architect and his masons and tradesmen. Alexander Gordon's Tobago estates went into decline in the years after his death. In 1799, Tobago exported almost 9,000 tonnes of sugar, and the saying, as rich as a Tobago planter, was common indeed. By 1834, however, Tobago's sugar exports had fallen to below 4,000 tonnes. In the 1840s, looking back on the declining fortunes of his Tobago estates, John Gordon blamed emancipation and the failure of the British government to protect West Indies sugar from foreign competition. In 1846, the net profit of his three estates was only £1,104. In the 1840s, the planters of Tobago, like elsewhere in the West Indies, were cutting the wages of their workforces in an effort to improve profits. By 1848, some plantation labourers on Tobago's sugar estates had quit and many of those that remained were on strike to resist the lowering of their wages. The Gordon estates supported plans to introduce indentured labourers to Tobago in order to undercut wages. In contrast to islands like Trinidad and Jamaica where large numbers of Indian indentured labourers were introduced, much smaller numbers of liberated Africans settled in Tobago. These men and women had been released from slaving ships captured by the Royal Navy's anti-slavery patrol and released at Freetown in Sierra Leone. In 1851, the Gordon estate of Bacoli employed 20 of these men and women. In 1852, Gordon sent his secretary, John Mackenzie, to Tobago to prepare a detailed report on the viability of the estates. Mackenzie discovered that the long years of slavery had created a powerful desire among former slaves to own their own land, but he was opposed to the system of sharecropping which was developing on the estate and which gave former slaves control over small areas of land which they could cultivate partly on their own account. But the opportunity for small tenants to live and work in dignity on the land was not part of the Gordon estate plan in Tobago. Mackenzie derided the aspirations of former slaves and was well aware of the conflict of interests at the heart of estate policy. Their highest ambition is to get a patch of ground to grow the necessities and these obtained, they live in indolence. Mackenzie recommended 
that the Tobago estates be rationalised, and in 1853 Gordon bought out the other half share of the estates and leased out Speyside and Tra Riviere while keeping control of Bacolay. This does not seem to have worked, and in 1860, two years after his death, all of Gordon's Tobago estates were sold off for £5,000. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the social and moral ties that had traditionally bound landowner and tenant in the Highlands were severed. Traditional Highland landowners increasingly viewed their estates simply as sources of income, and many landowners sold their clan lands and moved out. One such landowner was MacDonald of Clan Ranald, owner of South Uist and Ben Becula in the Outer Hebrides. As the income from his Highland estates declined and his debts mounted, his advisers told him that the best way to make money from his estates was to sell them off to someone else. Enter a willing buyer with huge capital resources and ready money, topped up by the recent compensation windfall from his slave estates in Tobago. John Gordon was looking for new investments and thought that he'd found the ideal opportunity in the Hebrides. A similar tale unfolded on the neighbouring island of Barra, whose historical association with Clan MacNeil stretched back centuries. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Barra estate rentals were based on four main sources – exporting black cattle, fishing, land rentals and kelp. Collecting and burning kelp was the means of processing an alkali residue which was used in glass and soap manufacturing. It was an amazing money spinner for many landowners in the Long Island. In the neighbouring Clan Ranald estate of South Uist, profits from kelp in the early 19th century were worth almost twice that of land rentals. In the 1790s, Clan Chief Colonel Roderick McNeil, who spent most of his time in Liverpool, had built an impressive mansion house at Yolagari, famous today as the location of the world's only beach landing strip. Yolagari House had replaced the decaying Kishmal's Castle, the ancestral home of the McNeil chiefs in Castle Bay, now much restored. But the building of Yolagari had added to Colonel McNeil's growing debts. This was a very unwelcome legacy for his son, also called Roderick. When kelp prices declined in the 1820s, they provided a critical problem for Roderick McNeil, who inherited his father's estate in 1822 and also his father's debt, around £30,000. In an attempt to extricate himself from his debts, he borrowed another £30,000 and erected a soda factory between 1830 and 1835 here in North Bay. This wall is the only part of the factory remaining. It must have been a colossal structure for the Barra of the time. The soda factory and related jobs on the island employed as many as 500 people. The factory even had an accommodation barracks for some of its workers. They had little choice but to comply with McNeil's orders that they work in the factory as a condition of their leases. The factory did not make profits quickly enough to prevent McNeil being declared bankrupt in 1836. With debts now totalling £115,000, McNeil fled the island, one step ahead of his creditors and, quite literally, carrying the family silver. He never returned to Barra. Two years later, ever the opportunist, 
John Gordon, who had been one of MacNeill's creditors, bought the island for the knockdown price of £38,000. The combined annual rental of Gordon's new estates was stated to be over £7,000 per annum, around £600,000 at, at today's values. He believed that with proper development they would yield much more, but there are suspicions that the rental potential of the estates had been deliberately inflated by the sellers. Gordon had bought his New Island estates when the market for kelp was already in decline, and when he began to collect his small tenant rents, he described them as a miserable sum. He was quickly discovering that the islands might not be the lucrative investments that he'd hoped for. With the golden age of kelp harvesting behind him, Gordon decided that estate improvements should concentrate on promoting large-scale sheep farming. Existing tenants would be cleared to poorer land elsewhere in the islands. By 1845, ten large farms had been established on South Uist and Benbecula, and another four were planned for Barra, all of them with 14-year leases. A report written in 1839 on South Uist by John Fleming, who became uh, Gordon's factor here at Cluny, provides more detail on the plans for the estates. Tenants who had been cleared from the good land on the west coast in order to make way for the proposed sheep farms were to be employed in drainage, land reclamation and road building. They were to be encouraged to collect kelp in order to pay their rents. Loch Boysdale was identified as a possible site for the development of a fishing village and Fleming suggested that east coast fishermen could be invited in to help. Indeed, Gordon seems to have had plans to enter the fishing business in the Hebrides himself. But Fleming's report ends on an ominous note. When these and other necessary improvements are completed, a great number of the population should be made to emigrate, and among the first lot I would clear away are all the subtenants that pay no rent and are a burden to the country. It's not clear when Gordon envisaged that these clearances or evictions would take place, but events were to force him to act perhaps earlier than he had originally intended. Between 1846 and 1851, a potato blight hit the Western Highlands. The consequences were to be catastrophic for Gordon's tenants and extremely damaging to his reputation. The repeated failure of the potato crop from the autumn of 1846 led to famine conditions in the Western Isles, although the scale of deaths experienced in Ireland was avoided in Scotland. There was less dependence on a single food crop. There was also determined action to feed and assist the starving by government, civic and religious bodies, and by many landowners. But a very bleak picture emerged from the Gordon Estates. Contemporary eyewitness accounts of the famine suggest that some of the very worst conditions in the Western Isles were experienced on South Uist and Barra. When the Reverend Norman MacLeod, a prominent Church of Scotland minister from Glasgow, who journeyed to the Western Isles on famine relief work, entered the Gordon estate of South Uist from North Uist in 1847, he reported, The scene of wretchedness was deplorable. Children with swollen bellies, shriveled legs, hollow eyes. MacLeod's descriptions were confirmed by Captain Cole, the government official sent to investigate the conditions on Gordon's estates. Criticism by government officials and by church figures like MacLeod led Gordon to distribute greater amounts of food at his own expense and to defer rental payments for many of his crofting tenants. 
but he bitterly resented what he regarded as interference in his private affairs. When the government ended its famine relief scheme in 1851 and responsibility for the poor fell on the estate owners, Gordon looked for ways in which to cut his losses. He allegedly offered to sell the island of Barra to the government for use as a penal colony. The government did not take up his offer. As the food crisis worsened in the Western Isles, the strongest hurricane in living memory swept across the West Indies in October 1847, causing immense damage to Gordon's estates and leading to appeals from his Tobago factor for substantial additional funds for reconstruction. The impact of these two crises, one in the West Indies and the other in the Western Isles, was decisive. In the three years that followed, Colonel John Gordon cleared 3,000 crofters and cotters from his Hebridean estates, shipping them to Canada on ships paid for or subsidised by Gordon himself. In one year alone, in 1851, 1,700 tenants were cleared. And some of these tenants were surviving the famine and able to pay their rents. But clearance was, and always had been, an instrument of estate policy, whatever the circumstances of the time. Some of the evictions in that year were only accomplished by violent coercion. The clearances of Bruernish and Balnabodach and Barra, organised by John Fleming, saw scenes of some of the worst intimidation on the Gordon estates. Residents from the townships were rounded up by estate officials, herded onto small boats and taken to Loch Boysdale. From there, over 400 bar residents sailed on the Admiral to Quebec in Canada. Immigration officials reported that many of the Barra immigrants had arrived completely destitute and relied on the Canadian authorities to forward them to settlement areas inland. Gordon rejected all criticism of his actions. When a large group of Barra people arrived destitute in Glasgow in 1850, Gordon was asked if he intended to help them. His answer perfectly summarised his views on the wider responsibilities of landowners to their tenants. In answer to your inquiry, what I propose doing with the people, I say nothing. I am neither legally nor morally bound to support a population reduced to poverty by the will of providence. Indeed, Gordon portrayed himself as a victim after the evictions in 1852, he wrote to his lawyers, My own case of oppression is as glaring as any. I derive as much income from Barra as from Windsor Park. Gordon's clearances in the Hebrides allowed him to find a solution to the immediate problems caused by famine. But he may also have had another motive. In 1850, with his estates in the Hebrides and Tobago in deep distress, and his conduct during the famine coming under increased scrutiny, he expressed his fears for the future. I am not without alarm for the safety of property in Great Britain, so loud and general are the complaints of the agricultural classes. Gordon may also have seen clearance as a way of preventing demands for change that might have surfaced among his tenants if they had been allowed to remain.
here in Aberdeenshire, far from Barra and much further from the Caribbean island of Tobago, John Gordon's legacy lives on. Gordon was described in his obituaries as an agricultural improver of note who was well liked by his northeast tenants and who had left his mark with this remarkable building. But decisions taken here ended the hopes of many of his Hebridean tenants that they might remain on the land. And decisions arrived at here denied more fundamental freedoms to the enslaved men and women of West African descent who laboured on his Tobago estates. And yet, for all his power over others, you might conclude that John Gordon was a captive too. He was imprisoned by the racism that allowed him to defend and justify the inhumanities of slavery. And he was trapped by the prejudices that he and many lowland Scots felt towards Gallic culture and its traditional view that the land was worth more than just money. There is no equivalence between the Highland clearances, however brutally they were carried out, and the prolonged violence of chattel slavery. Black slavery was uniquely racist, and Highland as well as Lowland Scots participated in it. But historical research helps to reveal the patterns of power and ownership that connect two of the darkest episodes in Scotland's recent history. The challenge for Scots today is how to openly and honestly acknowledge our past, learn lessons from it and build a genuinely inclusive future for all of us. <laughs>